For Kramer Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Lamini, freelance writer, journalist, and translator Fred de Fries is in conversation with Polity about his book titled Blues for the White Men, Hearing Black Voices in South Africa and the Deep South. So Fred, your book uh, titled Blues for the White Men, Hearing Black Voices in South Africa and the Deep South, it reflects on historical and more recent events, and it also delves into issues of race and racism. What inspired you to tackle issues in this way? You know, I was born in Holland and I was a big music fan as a teenager. My favorite bands were uh, what were called blues bands, but they weren't really blues bands. They were white rock and rollers who played sort of heavy, heavy metal inspired by blues. Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, bands like that. And when I got older, I wanted to know where this music came from, because then you start understanding that this was actually music music that came from the Deep South in uh, the United States, from places like Mississippi and also from Chicago further up. And I always dreamt of going there. And then I had an idea for a book looking for the roots of this music. But as I went along, you stumble upon many other things. I had two big trips to the Deep South uh, in 2016. And they were both each like six weeks, I think. And you start understanding much more about blues, about the meaning of blues, that blues is more like a metaphor for something much bigger and deeper. And it deals with the history of slavery. It, it deals with the history of oppression, the American version of apartheid, uh, the Jim Crow laws, the segregation the incarceration of all black people in the American jails. The idea grew on me, you know, that it shouldn't be a book only about music, but so only the first third is about music and the rest is about other issues still every now and then linking it to the music. And I also started linking it to South Africa because of the similarities in the histories of, of the Southern parts, particularly of the United States and South Africa, you know, slavery, civil war, uh, apartheid laws, uh, oppression of, of black liberation movements, then finally liberation in America in 1965 here, 1994. And then it continues with here, fees must fall. And in America, Black Lives Matter. That's it in a nutshell. From your, your traveling to America's deep South Africa, you draw historical parallels with South Africa's experiences of colonialism, slavery, racism, and resistance. Can you tell us about your insights? There were several things that I found really interesting. One is that the parallels are like, they used to be like a hundred years behind South Africa. You know, the America was sort of discovered by Columbus in 15 something. and here, Jan van Riebeek came in 16 something. So there was a hundred year difference. Then we saw that they brought in slaves to work on the land here. They brought in slaves in the Western Cape to work. Then there was of course, colonialism, which had a lot to do with uh, exploitation of, of the soil and of the people in America as well. Then we had the civil war in America between the North and the South here between Afrikaners and the, the English colonialists. And both sides then cut a deal later that would bring peace between the two white fighting parties and leave out the black population. In the Deep South, it's very black. You know, it's, it's blacker than I thought it would be. In some parts, like 80% of the, the towns has a black population and, and the whites live in the suburbs. So, but there's a difference there and here is that there black is a minority here, black is a majority, obviously. Um, and then I noticed when I started researching and I interviewed somebody in Jackson, Mississippi, who told me about the similarities in the constitution of Mississippi and the constitutions that later came in the, the British colonies with a black majority, where the whites in the minority, so like Kenya, uh, Australia, and South Africa. And it turned out that those constitutions laid the basis for the race politics that developed from then on. 
which I found I didn't know that at all. You know, you know about some of the similarities, but you don't know that it was like it almost seemed like a big conspiracy from the colonials to exploit and suppress the people in the colonies. And there were similar means that they used both here in Australia, in Kenya, in South Africa, in, in what was to be called Zimbabwe. So that I found really fascinating, and I would love to do more research on that. In the book, you also talk about a, a not so great interview, if I may say so, uh, Fred. Uh, amongst the people you interviewed uh, for this book was just musician. You share an encounter with uh, Abdullah Ibrahim. Can you reflect on your not so great encounter with <laughs> a renowned musician? I interviewed him. That was before I went to America for, the, for my research. A couple of years, actually. He was here for a tour and we the press were invited to interview him and my slot i think was the last slot and the interview was somewhere in a hyatt hotel i think in rosebank and i'd really prepared very very well you know as a journalist you you try to prepare very well but this one in particular because i thought wow he's one of the most famous jazz musicians in the world so i must really really come prepared so i read up on him i had lots of questions and uh, initially he was quite friendly. He said, well, let's go to my suite on the top floor of the Hyatt Hotel. The other interviews took place in the basement somewhere. And, um, and I thought, wow, that's amazing. You know, in his room and, and sort of very close to him. And, and he said, do you want to eat something? I said, no, no, just eat, and, but you go ahead. And then I started asking a few questions and I realized that this wasn't going to be an easy interview. You know, he was sort of grumpy and he answered, you know, I said, well, I'm also trying to learn the piano. He wasn't interested at all in me playing the piano. So I thought, okay, well, let's switch to, to proper interview now. And from the first or second question on, it went downhill and he became increasingly grumpy and he started accusing me of not knowing what jazz is he said do you know what jazz is and uh, you know you 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 know it's going to be getting worse and worse and worse there was no way out it's like you fall into a ditch and you can't clamber out and uh, every every question i had was answered with a snarl and and like one word or something yes or no or a stupid question so in the end after i timed it because i had a, a little recording device um, it was 11 minutes and 42 seconds or something that I grabbed my jacket and I said, sorry, this isn't going anywhere. And he said, no. And I walked out. And as a journalist, you know how it affects you later. You know, you feel put down and for no reason, really. But also you feel like it's slightly traumatizing in your work, in your line of work, because you start feeling very insecure and you think, am I stupid? Did I really ask the wrong questions? Why is this man treating me like this? And it kept nagging me and bugging me for a long time. And, you know, the first few interviews I had after that, I felt really, really anxious and sort of thinking maybe I didn't do enough. And fortunately, it went well. So that that feeling goes after a while. But and I, I kept thinking, why was he like this to me? I mean, he's not known for being a very generous person. But there was something particularly nasty about this that had no real reason. He didn't have any reason. I was polite. I was interested. You know, there was no reason for him to be so mean. So that kept ringing in my head, that whole episode. And I thought maybe it has to do with this thing called black pain. I mean, he led a very hard life. He was uh, in exile for a long time. Uh, he lost his father at a very early age. He, he had difficulties coming back. I think he had a very difficult marriage. He has difficult children. You know, there's a lot problematic about him. I thought that issue of black pain, maybe I should explore that more and try to understand where that comes from. And that sort of set the tone for my journey to the United States and my journey here in South Africa after that. 
and talking about black pain and then in the book you also interview uh, the UCT student leader Ramabina Mahaba who grew up in Limpopo you note in the book that uh, the impossibility for you uh, to grasp the kind of black pain that results from racism can you explain what you mean Ramabina was very good you know he was very kind and patient with me and he he tried to explain what it feels like as you say, he's from somewhere rural Limpopo. And before he came to study in Cape Town, he had hardly encountered white people. And then he came here in the Cape and he encountered the inequality. You know, I can't feel what it's like to be a black student from Limpopo entering Cape Town. And there's this, this I assume, this feeling of superiority from, from the whites at automatic. He said, when he studied, the white students automatically have that idea that sort of entitlement, um, arrogance, without them even knowing that they have it, it's like inbuilt, it's ingrained in them. We don't have, in Holland, we don't have those private schools that you have here, and things are, are more open, I guess. But here, if you go to one of these elite schools, uh, St. John's in Joburg, or those schools, uh, Michael House and them, um, I think you automatically grow up with the feeling of I'm superior because I had this incredible education. My parents are rich. I mean, you have to be rich to be there. And it's something that will never disappear, I think. So for me, I mean, I'm, I'm from a different background and I lived a couple of years in Kenya and Uganda and all my friends there were black, you know, because you're the, one of the few whiteies there. and you hang out and I wrote for local magazines, local newspapers. So, and they accepted me as I was, you know, sometimes they joked about me and I could joke about them. And there was no, no difference as far as I could tell. But here it's, it's totally different, I think because of apartheid, obviously, but also because of, of certain attitudes and educational differences. And I can't feel what it's like to be treated in a certain way that black people will feel. But I can see it sometimes. As you know, if I'm sort of slightly outside myself, I can observe and I think, okay, well, that's going to a supermarket, for instance, the way sometimes people are treated is like weird for me. And um, so that I've been trying to understand. And I don't think I can ever fully grasp it the same way you cannot grasp what it is to be Jewish and have parents or grandparents who were murdered during the Holocaust. It's, it's like an impossibility, but we can try at least and sort of try to understand and feel empathy. I have a little example in my book where I go to, it was the one year remembrance of Fees Must Fall. And there was an event happening at the art gallery at UCT. And I went there and I wanted to speak to the black students about about music, about the songs they used, the songs they sang, the sort of struggle songs. And uh, so I approached them and they were all dressed in black and they looked very militant, you know, that those black berets and, and the girls were all dressed in black. So I said, can I ask you something to, to one of the, the female students? And she turned around, put her back to me and ignored me completely. I think for the first time I could sort of feel what it's like to be treated like that. You know, suddenly I was the invisible man, whereas I think before black people were very often treated as invisible. You know, there was the maids walking around the house who overheard things, but everybody ignored her, you know, that sort of thing. And I thought, OK, that's a tiny little touch of what it feels like to be treated like that. Fred, you've already written books uh, based on traveling, on music and others on culture. What is different about this one? Well, I think this, this book is where everything comes together. I mean, all my deep interests, which is music, obviously, traveling. I like to see new cultures. I like to meet people. I like to see how people live. I like to compare. And then the whole sort of historical impact of things, where you go deeper and deeper and deeper. For the first, I'm also relating Holland to South Africa, to the Deep South. I mean, it was a very ambitious book, I think, and I'm not sure if I always succeed, but 
it 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 made the dream come true basically because combining all these things into one book and thinking about all these issues and relating them to music sort of music is the red thread in the book and and drawing conclusions and seeing how music unites people and thinking how important it is that we stay multicultural instead of separating and going for identity politics so yeah i know it was a very important book for me your main reason uh, for traveling to to america was was to discover whether a white man could sing the blues can you briefly tell us about that i, I was curious why white middle-aged men like me and you meet a lot of them there in the deep south sort of blues tourists why they relate to this music that was made by poor black people who have they do have very little in common with somebody living in london or somebody living in rotterdam in my case and i wanted to find out the appeal of the music and the lyrics and the sort of imagery to us and i think somewhere down the line i i started to understand that it has to do with sort of outsider status that people always admire you know you do admire people who live slightly outside the law who do their own thing who it's not to do with oppression so much as wanting to be free wanting to be not tied by certain things certain conventions and blues musicians symbolize that to us who grew up in a white middle class environment because they did it they lived the life as we say you know they paid the price as well because many of them were stabbed to death like robert johnson who's like the big hero of the of the black blues from mississippi others became alcoholics or heroin addicts and you know there's something slightly sinister about us sort of admiring that lifestyle at the same time but i do understand much better now why why these kids from london in the mid 60s started playing that kind of music and why it, because they came out of the war and they wanted to be free and they wanted to be independent from the old conservative generation and blues gave them that that vehicle to use and to to be that what they wanted to be and i guess that's what we admire there uh would you say that you have gotten a better understanding now of of why people behave the way they do after hearing so many different voices yeah i i guess i do what what struck me particularly in america is how because i mainly interviewed black people there i mean the subtitle of the book is hearing black voices in south africa and the deep south and how easy it was to approach them and how willing they were to talk to me because i thought i'd encounter like a million abdullah ibrahims but that wasn't the case people were very open they were very happy to tell the story to tell me a complete outsider about their lives about their struggles about how they saw the future and and i thought we maybe we have all these in bread things that we think people won't talk to us but actually do and they're happy to talk to you i mean i spoke to the black lives matter the representative in uh, atlanta mary hooks who was incredibly open and friendly i mean she wasn't particularly keen on white americans that's you can read that in the book how she treats them how she talks about them but the openness and and the willingness to communicate I thought that's so important and I think sometimes in South Africa we we lack that idea a bit like you know when I encountered the, the students at UCT who didn't even want to know what I wanted to talk about or where I was from or who I represented they just turned their back to me and I thought that's not the way to do it actually I mean first you ask somebody and then you can decide whether you want to talk to them or not so yeah I do think I understand much better and I try to to spread the gospel to other people because I think it's important that we listen to each other that we try to understand each other. We may not agree and we may want to live separate lives but 
understanding, I think, is, is of essential importance in this day and age. There was Fred de Vries in conversation with Polity about his book titled Blues for the White Men, Hearing Black Voices in South Africa and the Deep South.